Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk about Apache Apex. Um, I'm Thomas, and I'm here with uh, Pramod uh, to give you an introduction to what Apex is uh, today. And uh, probably you have heard about stream data processing a lot at this conference. There were a number of great talks. Um, uh, and I'm curious uh, who has heard about Apex before? Okay, that's good. And um, uh, how many of you uh, have uh, used the stream processing framework so far? Nice. So um, let's uh, start then with um, um, what is stream data processing in a short summary. Um, so we have uh, a number of data sources, an increasing number of data sources and also increasing volumes of data uh, that we would like to process and uh, uh, turn into actionable insights. Um, data come from IT, IoT devices, a uh, wide range of data from Kafka topics. Um, files, uh, files are also um, uh, actually a continuous source of data uh, as they are being continuously produced, uh, then social media feeds and so on. So there is a lot of data, large volumes, and we want to find ways to process that. Um, what is common uh, to these is these are continuous streams of data. So there's not really a start and an end point. Uh, the data keeps coming, and uh, we want to be able to um, uh, process it and compute uh, results from it. Um, the uh, architecture um, to uh, deal with uh, large volumes of data and with high throughput is really an in-memory processing architecture. And uh, there are a number of frameworks out there that do uh, processing in memory. Um, in addition to that, when we have a continuous stream of data, we need to establish um, boundaries at which we can do computations so, and um, at which we can emit the results. And uh, those are called windows in uh, stream data processing systems and most of the time, uh, time-based windows. Um, what is very important uh, to do uh, this type of processing is that we can maintain state uh, in a system. So um, let's say I want to compute a count. I need to uh, collect um, uh, the data, and I need to count. I add every time uh, I receive a new event. I add uh, to the count, but I need to maintain that count in memory, right? And I can't uh, lose it because at some point I need to uh, materialize that result and provide it to a downstream system. Uh, so uh, state management, stateful operation is key uh, to stream data processing. Um, having that foundation and then being able to do aggregation rules processing and so on, that enables us to build streaming analytics pipelines. Uh, then what do we do with the results? The results uh, um, can be made available to a ver uh, variety of uh, other systems. The usual suspects, databases, uh, files, um, but also a message bus like Kafka to give it to uh, other downstream systems. And an interesting um, uh, idea also that was presented earlier today was actually to make the data available from the in-memory state that we have uh, to, um, uh, to a querying system directly. Uh, so this is an, um, this is an example uh, flow uh, here. We have a browser that uh, generates events on a web server. Uh, they uh, manifest in logs, and then those logs go into a Kafka uh, topic, uh, let's say. And then the blue boxes are what, uh, what Apex would be doing, right? Processing the data from Kafka. So it's a consumer, it takes, gets the data from Kafka. And then, for example, uh, we could uh, retrieve the log lines. Uh, we might decompress. Um, a message, a pass individual lines, filter, and then uh, there are, we have a stateful operation, which is the aggregation. We actually need to accumulate some data first, and then we can compute the result from it. Then we can provide it uh, for consumption. And in this example, we choose a Kafka topic as the destination too, uh, because that could uh, send it to another system or to a, um, a front end. Uh, it's actually interesting that uh, a very similar system we're going to present, uh, or a use case uh, that uh, very closely represents to this pipeline an existing customer um, uh, that is using Apex uh, in production, uh, using this to actually visualize data in real time from the in-memory state of the pipeline. So what is Apex? What can it do? It's uh, doing in-memory distributed stream processing. And uh, it um, uh, basically uh, divides the, um, uh, the processing logic uh, uh, over ma many machines and uh, can parallelize the computation and uh, therefore um, scale out and uh, 
do uh, the computation. Uh, it uh, is Java based. It provides an API for um, you also to build custom uh, uh, building blocks in addition to the library of building blocks that's already provided. Um, it's uh, scalable, it's a high throughput system, and it can do computation with low latency. Um, and uh, in addition to uh, the scalability in general, uh, it's also possible to scale um, up and down uh, dynamically uh, with Apex. So uh, elasticity, uh, we refer that to. Um, uh, it also has a number of optimizations for a compute locality that allows you to arrange uh, the, um, the different, uh, we call them operators, in the system for better performance, uh, collocate in the thread or collocate on the same machine or in the same process. Um, important um, um, things from the beginning uh, for us were uh, fault tolerance and operability. So fault tolerance, uh, of course, uh, and correctness, not to lose any data, uh, also not to double count, um, and the, uh, the overarching goal to provide uh, a system that can do end-to-end -end exactly once uh, processing means taking into account not only the stream processor itself, but also the interaction with external systems uh, to uh, give you a strong processing guarantee. Uh, so stateful means the state is preserved. Uh, there is something that, uh, there's a mechanism to bring back the state uh, uh, in the event of a failure. And uh, so checkpointing is the way to, um, to keep the durable copy that can be used for recovery. Uh, then for operability, um, uh, there are a number of interesting uh, features in Apex. Um, the, uh, the availability of uh, various metrics uh, that can be used um, um, not just to look at, but also uh, to do scaling decisions and so on. Also the ability to record data and uh, to visualize data uh, as it's being computed in the, uh, in the system. And then also to perform dynamic changes, which is configuration changes, but also changes to the, to the logic itself. Um, while the uh, system uh, is running. So in the Hadoop stack, Apex is a Hadoop-based uh, platform. It runs on top of YARN and HDFS, and um, it's um, broken down into uh, two uh, pieces. The uh, engine, uh, the engine which uh, provides for the uh, high-performance fault-tolerance uh, uh, fault tolerance streaming, and uh, the data and motion processing, um, and then the uh, library um, uh, Malha, which uh, provides uh, ready-made operators that uh, you can use to assemble applications. There is a wide range of connectors in there uh, that interface with uh, most of the common uh, systems out there. Uh, I mentioned Kafka earlier, but there are also connectors for uh, HBase, Cassandra, um, uh, and uh, RabbitMQ, and many other systems. Uh, so chances are you will find what you need uh, there. Uh, on top of that, uh, DataTorrent uh, provides a number of value-added tools for visualization. Those actually use the same REST API that is also available uh, to, to build custom tooling uh, that allows you to access applications at runtime, get stats from there, um, but also control certain aspects and make dynamic changes. So there is a nice management console um, um, to, uh, uh, for, for, for the admin. Uh, there is also a visualization uh, dashboard uh, for data visualization as it's being computed inside Apex applications and a way to assemble applications um, without writing the Java code. So I said that Apex is a Hadoop native system. Um, what that means is, um, or YARN native rather, what that means is um, there is an application master. For every application that a user launches on the cluster, there's a separate application master. Uh, and um, the application master is uh, responsible for acquiring the resources that are needed uh, to, for, for, for the distributed uh, compute. So it will look at the uh, processing uh, graph that was defined and then it will acquire the containers. Uh, it will acquire the containers initially, but it's also able to acquire resources dynamically as the application is running. Because if we uh, talk about things like dynamic changes, dynamic scaling up and down, or uh, introducing new compute logic, you need to be able to go and get the resources for it. And, uh, and that happens by interacting with the YARN resource manager. So the green boxes, the other green boxes with the numbers, those are the streaming containers. So with that, 
all the, um, all the things that you are familiar with from Yarn Apply or from Hadoop in general. It plays nice with security, it, uh, you have multi-tenancy, and you have full isolation uh, for applications on a secure cluster. The application uh, development model, um, it's uh, operators and streams, uh, and uh, you form a directed acyclic graph. There's one is exception to the directed acyclic graph is uh, when you do when you want to do iter iteration uh, processing. It's actually possible also to feed the output of one operator back upstream as an input. So a stream is a sequence of data tuples in a streaming first um, system. We process event by event without uh, waiting for batches and things like that. So. Uh, each event is presented to the uh, operator as a separate uh, call. And um, so the stream is a sequence of uh, such tuples that is given to the operator. An operator can accept multiple streams and it can produce multiple streams too. Um, yes, and so operators can be pre-built operators from the library or custom-built operators against the Apex API. So then uh, the next um, um, concept that is important uh, for the state management is uh, checkpointing and uh, uh, the, we, we call it the streaming window also in Apex, not to confuse with application level windowing. Um, these are um, events that flow uh, through uh, the um, graph, processing graph through the execution layer along with the data. So um, every source uh, will generate periodically, and the default is 500 millisecond uh, window tuple. The window tuple traverses the entire DAG. Um, that provides an opportunity to do processing periodically that we don't want to do on every single event. That is optional. But inside the engine, it is also being used for checkpointing. So at configurable intervals, such tuple will be a checkpoint tuple. Those are the colorful markers that you see here. The, the data tuples are gray. You will might not see them clearly, but the, the colored markers, those are the control tuples, they flow through uh, the system. So when such a yellow checkpoint tuple arrives um, at an operator, the operator will uh, snapshot the state and save it to durable storage. Uh, so that means because um, every operator does that uh, asynchronously and in a distributed way, that there's no blocking and there's no central um, entity involved in the checkpointing. Uh, and uh, the saving of the checkpoints uh, is also asynchronous, um, so to not block the processing. So with this checkpointing, we have a consistent state. We can uh, go back to that state uh, when we need it for recovery, uh, but it's also needed, uh, for example, for dynamic partitioning when we need to redistribute the state. Uh, important point here, uh, no artificial latency. The, these streaming windows or intervals have nothing to do with micro patches. These are just additional events inserted into the flow and traversing the DAG. So what then about event-based computation? So um, it's important that we, we can do a processing based on event time because this is how uh, the user most of the time understands the data and also to decouple the processing uh, from the from the time at uh, which a window uh, from the time at which an event was generated for example we may want to replay uh, last uh, week's data and we want to have the same results so we need to be able to look at the uh, event time so how uh, does that work when you uh, do when you do processing on apex you have your data tuples, and the data tuples contain the timestamp. That's the event time. Uh, the um, uh, dark blue box is on the top. Uh, below uh, the arrow, you have the state. So the state, those are time buckets, really, and uh, the, uh, the processing of the data tuples affects the state. The uh, vertical lines are checkpoints, uh, moments where checkpoints are taken. So as the events come in, we update the time, time buckets and uh, then uh, the checkpointing will actually make sure that uh, the data is saved. So as you can see, you can repeat the same sequence of events, we will uh, achieve the same result. Um, in addition um, to that, uh, uh, Apex uh, operators uh, support also a number of the other, other windowing semantics um, that you might be familiar with uh, from Beam. So scalability is achieved through partitioning. Um, 
this first uh, slide probably will look familiar to you. So you have one uh, logical operator or task. You want to have multiple um, of those in the execution layer so that you can hand process more data. Uh, then in addition to the uh, task, there is the uh, unifier that uh, brings back the output of multiple uh, um, partitions. Uh, what that unifier exactly does, of course, depends on the compute logic. So if you have an oper for example, let's say we are counting, then the unifier is simple, right? You're just adding up uh, all the partial counts and we get the total count, and that's great. Uh, but if we do a top-end uh, computation, then the unifier logic is uh, much more involved and uh, different. So that's why the unifier in Apex is also a pluggable component, but it's tightly related uh, to the operator that is uh, getting partitioned. So on the right side, that's shuffle, really, what you see there. Each operator can, the parallelism on each operator can be controlled separately, and uh, then the unifiers um, are also uh, partitioned as to avoid bottlenecks um, uh, in, in the processing. So this is standard stuff. Uh, it's uh, shuffle. So let's go to the uh, advanced partitioning. So uh, Apex uh, has a concept of parallel partitioning. Parallel partitioning means I don't want to have a shuffle after every operator. I would like to uh, process multiple, do uh, multiple computations in a sequence, and then I only I want to have a unifier. So uh, it's possible to express that. So we can build uh, parallel pipes here. So uh, for example, here you have uh, three operators arranged, uh, and then you have another partition of three operators. So these process independently. Of course, this provides for greater efficiency, right? Because we don't need the shuffle, but it also has another benefit. If I'm, let's say I don't have this operator, the last one, and I don't need a unifier, then I have truly independent pipelines. And uh, they process independently. They also are independent when it comes to recovery. Uh, so let's say one operator fails this one here, then there will be no effect whatsoever on this pipe here uh, in the Apex topology. But uh, these two operators, they will have to be reset to checkpoint and recovered. Um, this is a unique feature in Apex, and it enables to, you to do things like speculative execution uh, to uh, achieve uh, an SLA guarantee. Uh, then uh, we have cascading unifiers. Um, so uh, assume we have an operation that reduces the data. Uh, so as, uh, we get a high, so, uh, high volume input, uh, but we have a relatively small output uh, in terms of data volume. So now we may have a bottleneck here, the network interface, for example, on a single machine. Uh, this, you, can, uh, by, uh, you can overcome this in Apex by cascading the unifier. You will simply have multiple um, unifiers in a sequence, which will, of course, add to the latency. But it, uh, in, in first instance, it, it allows you to actually uh, handle that data volume. So you've got a, a, a partial reduction down here, partial reduction down here, and then another level down there. And this can cascade. If you have a very large number of partitions, you can also have multiple levels. So then uh, we support dynamic partitioning, um, as I said um, earlier. So we have, um, uh, let, let's say we have two operators each of uh, one and two. And uh, now um, uh, we, based on, based on the metric, uh, this can be throughput or latency or some external uh, information, we want to uh, scale this up and we want to allocate more resources to it. So that's possible. Uh, it's the, the, both the trigger, uh, the trigger uh, that decides that we want to make such a scaling um, uh, decision is customizable as well as the logic also that uh, distributes the state amongst these partitions because while you had two partitions here, now you have four uh, over here, but it's a stateful system. So each of these partitions has state in it that needs to be carried over. And actually how the state of two is redistributed into four partitions, that's something in many cases that only the developer of the operator or the application knows. So there are some uh, default implementations that we have, but in general, this is all something that uh, the user can influence. So we can do dynamic scaling, uh, we can acquire additional resources, and uh, then we can um, throttle it uh, back down. So one uh, example of that is actually Kafka consumer. If the Kafka cluster changes, right, then we could uh, automatically detect that from the metadata that we have more partitions, and we can bring up additional uh, consumers, or we just uh, change the mapping how Kafka partitions are consumed by the uh, Apex um, operators. 
So fault tolerance operator state is uh, checkpointed uh, to persistent uh, store. The default uh, for that is HDFS. And the, um, there are two things that are happening during checkpointing. The operator or the engine will receive the checkpoint tuple that I talked earlier uh, about. Uh, then it will take the state uh, from the operator and uh, take it into, into a copy, and then that copy needs to be written uh, to a durable store. So the second operation is something that happens asynchronously. And uh, to HDFS by default, it's pluggable backend actually for checkpointing. Um, recently, we had a contribution to uh, make this uh, work with uh, Geode, uh, Apache Geode as well, and uh, so any other backend could be used uh, to do the checkpointing. Uh, HDFS is just a default because Apex runs with minimum dependencies on Hadoop. So in case of a failure, then an operator can be brought back to the checkpoint and we don't lose the state. And I will uh, talk also about how we don't lose uh, the data that is uh, in flight. So uh, we, um, we have two ways of detecting that something failed. One is yarn, of course, telling us that a process has failed and with the exit status, we understand what to do with it. Then we have the heartbeat uh, mechanism of each container. Uh, the application master state is checkpointed. The controller also needs to be checkpointed because we say that we can do dynamic changes in the topology. Now we need to keep track of that knowledge too. So that is done. Um, and then we buffer the data. So the, the, this is uh, to uh, preserve the in-flight data. And uh, the way this works is with a buffer server. Each operator that produces data sends it to a buffer. And then the downstream operator takes it from the buffer. This is an in-memory pub-sub mechanism. This is like Kafka without disk, sort of. Because we don't, we, we don't need the fault tolerance for that buffer, but we need the buffer to be available. Uh, if the, this operator fails, we bring back the checkpoint, that, uh, bring back the replacement with checkpointed state, and it will go back and subscribe with the buffer as of with the position of the checkpointed state. So there is no need to do anything over here if this operator fails. There is no resetting the entire topology in Apex. This is incremental recovery. Um, and uh, the same mechanism is also used for dynamic partitioning. So finally, uh, we have end-to-end -end exactly once. Um, so uh, we, um, Apex um, has the ability to uh, do the checkpointing, doesn't lose the data. It, uh, is an, uh, it, it, uh, it will replay the data when it's needed, uh, given item potent operation. This is exactly once within the system, and then depending on what system we are interacting with, and this is where the operator library comes into the picture. We are utilizing uh, the support that that respective system offers. So for example, when we are writing to a database, we will use transactions. When we are writing to files, we will use atomic file renames. Uh, whatever technique is available with a message bus, it might be the last message uh, value uh, that we query. So we can achieve uh, an end-to-end -end exactly uh, once semantics. So with that, I will hand it over to Pramod and he will talk about the application development yeah. on Apex. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so, so far, uh, we saw the features and functionality of the Apex uh, stream processing engine, um, scalability and fault tolerance features that it provides. Uh, now let's like, take a little bit of a look into the application development. So in some of these slides, uh, you will see an Apex logo on the top, and some won't. When you see the Apex logo on the top, that means that that's already in Apex, that's a feature in Apex. Otherwise, it's an add-on that's being provided by Data Torrent. So um, the easiest way to build applications, if you already have your business logic, is, is our uh, pipeline builder. Um, so as Thomas talked about earlier, uh, you basically, to build your application, you write these operators, which are the building units of your application, and encompass your business logic. Uh, so with this pipeline builder, you can connect these operators up to quickly um, get your pipelines going. Uh, you can configure these um, operators and uh, basically just build uh, operators, uh, different kinds of uh, pipelines. So uh, then uh, if you want more flexibility and uh, when you're actually building this business logic, um, you basically do your, build your application in Java. There are two ways that are supported. Uh, there's a low-level API and there's a high-level API. Um, the low-level API is more compositional. Um, you're actually building a graph. Um, you're basically specifying the individual processing units in the graph, uh, you, and then you're connecting them up. So this is a simple word count application uh, with four operators. Uh, the first one's reading the data from an input source. The second one is parsing it. The third one is counting the words continuously, and the fourth one's outputting it, uh, just showing it to you on a console. Uh, so this, in this API, you can see uh, in the uh, compositional API, you can, the first four lines are basically instantiating those operators and the next three lines are connecting them up. 
so the next one is a high-level API, uh, which is um, uh, easier to pick up with, pick up and, and go. So this one, um, you can actually build uh, uh, build your applications um, in a descriptive, in a declarative fashion. Uh, here, you're basically specifying a sequence of operations to perform on your data. Um, and uh, basically, you use the Apex Stream API for this. Um, so here, you can see um, you're first specifying the, to pick up the data from a folder, uh, from files in a folder, then apply a, a, a simple function on each event, um, and then do a count and print. And uh, these are extensible as well. Uh, you can extend the Stream API um, and, this, and these functionalities. And you can also uh, actually add the um, add low-level operators. You can mix the low-level operators with the high-level API uh, as well. Uh, so this is a new feature uh, that's going to come out in our next version 3.5, uh, where we're going to where we have uh, high-level support for the different um, event time windowing. Uh, uh, specifications that are specified by Beam. And uh, so this is a modified version of the previous example where we are basically uh, applying, a, uh, applying a window, um, bon uh, win windows on it, uh, application windows on it. So where we are saying that uh, we basically want to output the result every one second and we want a cumulative count. And uh, since the data is, uh, since there's no boundaries as such, we are basically creating one global window. And uh, we are also working on an a beam runner, um, and that will be out shortly as well. So uh, how would you actually go about, uh, let's say you want to build a new operator, your own custom business logic that's not uh, from the ones that's already provided, uh, how, do you, how do you go about do, doing that? So here's a couple of examples. Uh, so the first one uh, is a simple parser. Uh, all you define uh, was to, to basically receive data, you define an input port, and you just implement one callback called process. And whenever data arrives to your operator, this method is called. And in this method, you can do any custom processing you want. And when you want to output some data, you, cre you basically emit it to an output port. Um, that's it. So each operator does not have to worry about where the data is coming from or the way where the data is going next. Uh, you can just concentrate on your business logic of at that stage. Uh, and at the bottom, you see a more, uh, more complex operator, which has state. So this is, the, this is a counter, so it's basically counting the uh, number of unique events it's receiving. So it's keeping the current counts in a map, and it's incrementing it every time a new event is received. Um, this, uh, this, this state is preserved, so even if your operator goes down, it will be recovered with the, from the checkpointed state, and uh, you don't have to do anything special. So this is done for you by automatically. Any variables that you have in your operator that are not transient will be preserved and recovered. So this is our uh, brief overview of our operator library, uh, uh, listing the commonly used and uh, uh, commonly used uh, func operators. Um, uh, basically, I want to mention uh, Kafka. Uh, so we have very robust support for Kafka. Our Kafka operators are dynamically partitionable, as Thomas was mentioning earlier. So they'll detect the number of uh, partitions on the Kafka side for a topic, and they'll scale accordingly. They support multiple topic ingestion. They support both point eight and point nine API. And they're all, they, uh, they're all fault tolerant and item potent. And uh, so you can see there are different kinds of operators here. There's operators for messaging, uh, NoSQL, uh, parsers, uh, common ETL stuff for analytics, dimensions, and a whole bunch of other operators. Uh, so when your application's running, um, you basically, it's a distributed application. There are many components, and, 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 and all of these are running uh, on a cluster. You don't want it to be a black box. You want to see what's going on. You want to know what's going on. Uh, this is where the monitoring console comes in. So when your application is running, um, you can actually see uh, all the individual operators and partitions. Uh, you can look at their stats. Uh, you can look at their configuration. You can look at the resources they're using. Um, you can even record data um, live um, as this application is running. And for developers, um, uh, the console also provides uh, easy debugging tools like looking at the logs all in one place, searching through logs. Uh, and if there are any uh, uh, failure events and recovery, you, you can basically find all those here. And these are basically two views uh, of an application. So the left is the logical view. So this is the, uh, this is the application as you uh, designed it. And on the right side, shows the multiple partitions so as you can see, the block reader and block writer actually partition four ways. Um, so you can basically see uh, at both uh, uh, at a logical level and a physical level um, all the details. And uh, 
there's one, one thing you can see on the right, actually, if it's not, I don't know if it's clear, but uh, the partitions are of this, uh, so the block reader and block writer partitions are of the same color. That's, that is actually showing locality. That's another feature we provide. Uh, these operators could be uh, separate processes running on different uh, machines. They could be uh, on the same machine. They could be running within the same process as different threads, or they could be running inside the same thread. So we allow uh, different placement of operators um, based on uh, you know, your data needs, based on your processing needs. Uh, and this is another capability that DataTorrent provides, is real-time dashboards. Um, so if you, re if you want to visualize your data uh, from, uh, from the output of your application in real time without, without it actually touching a store, you can do that. And we provide a rich set of widgets as well. Uh, you can add your own widgets uh, as well. Uh, so just briefly, I uh, want to touch upon some of the use cases. Um, so uh, we have, so Apex and DataDonnet are being used in production um, in, um, in different places. And uh, these are basically uh, use cases where the customers have uh, talked about these uh, and they have done meetups. And uh, there's a slide after these use cases which has links to those uh, videos and slides as well. So the first one's uh, Pubmatic. They are in the ad space. Um, and they provide analytics for publishers. So they are able to analyze your um, ad impressions and click logs and slice and dice that information and perform different dimensional uh, combinations and cubing and show those results in real time. Um, so they are, they're using it. And uh, this, this is a brief overview of you know, how much data they're processing and, and uh, what is the outcome of them using Apex. The second one is uh, GE. So GE is uh, one of the leaders in industrial IoT. Uh, they have built a platform called Predix, which is a cloud-based platform, and uh, it's, it's used to basically process uh, data from all the GE machines that are deployed across the world. I think about windmills, uh, you know, deep sea oil rigs, uh, think of you know, whatever, uh, you know, GE is pretty, pretty big. So uh, with GE, GE basically is using uh, uh, Apex in their time series uh, application uh, service, uh, where they're, they're basically using it to ingest and process uh, high-speed data um, in order of millions of events per second. Uh, so next is uh, Silver Spring Networks. Um, they are also in the IoT space. Um, they basically uh, provide the technology for smart meters uh, for utilities, and they basically are able to uh, they provide technology to collect and process data. And uh, they are they are basically using Apex to analyze uh, logs and failures uh, so that they can uh, predict future outages, uh, big outages. And, uh, and they're basically uh, uh, getting input data is XML and they're doing processing and their outputs Avro um, and uh, so, so essentially they're different file formats they're using for their different applications. And this, this page has the links for the use cases uh, that I talked about if you wanna go in depth into detail and, and, and look at what those are. So in the last page, uh, some more resources uh, about Apex and any of the features that Thomas and or I talked about, if you want to go in detail, uh, there are slides there and, and videos um, that basically give you uh, more details on these. Um, is it, um, any questions? Yes, go ahead. If the locality is node local, which is there are different processes on the same node, data is still serialized, but it's through the loopback interface, so you're not affecting, you're not sending the data over the network, but if they're in the same container, then there's no serialization. It's just going through an in-memory queue. Okay, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it uses D3 underneath. So the widgets are pluggable, so you can, you can you have, of course your widget has to follow certain uh, API, but yeah, you can plug in a different framework if you want. I think. Yes, we do, uh, we do have operators that allow you to do that. Um, so are you talking about like application data? Yeah, so we, we have uh, uh, what's called managed state, um, 
which is uh, if you have a large amount of state in your operator and you cannot store it all in memory, uh, we provide a, a, a basically a, a, a smart state management system that basically spills to disk. Yeah. Yes. Since the last checkpoint, because the operators, the new partitions will start from the last uh, committed state. Yes, it's okay. it's consistent state, right? So we need to uh, when you do uh, a partitioning, you need to take the current state or the, the last consistent state that you have. You have to redistribute it uh, to get a new state, and you have to bring it online. So uh, we can only take data that is consistent. Uh, it's actually similar to the recovery case. Uh, when an operator goes down, it goes back to the most recent available state that we have checkpointed, right? or the most recent possible. Uh, the dynamic partitioning works in a similar way. Yes, because um, the the data is already available in the buffer of the upstream operator, so it will automatically be replayed. So the operator will restart and it will pull the data from the from the buffer. Yeah. Unless it's the input operator, which is the first operator. In that case, it needs to keep track of the offset in its state. For example, the Kafka operator keeps track of the offset, so when it restart, it pulls the data from the offset. No, the, the actual data is in the buffer, but, but these things are moving forward and old, older data is being discarded when, when the entire uh, DAG has checkpointed beyond the point. Yeah. Yes? Yes, we do, on our, on yeah. our Apex, on the Apex, Apache Apex website, you can. There, there, yeah, there's a, there, there is, there are, we, we benchmark the stream uh, throughput on every release, and uh, those, uh, those are published. Uh, we also have our contribution to Yahoo uh, performance benchmark. Um, that is actually in a, in a repository out there. There was a preliminary uh, presentation about that, uh, but we will shortly publish a blog also, which we got uh, pretty good results, so uh, stay tuned. So, so what? Uh, so it 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 achieved with the with the uh, with the platform and the operator working together. Typically, the output operator. So the platform guarantees that it will recover the state and it will play the uh, you know you'll receive the tuples in an idempotent fashion, right? So if you look at um, the output operators that we have in the library, for example, the file output operator or the database operator, they will basically ensure that the the state with the external system is consistent. With the with what they've recovered from the checkpoint, so that they don't duplicate the data. So I could go into details if you want offline. But uh, after that, yeah. No. We, we 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 do have uh, we can, we can take uh, take it also offline in case there are other questions. But we have we do have uh, we do have uh, actually operators specifically for file output that preserve the exactly one semantic. Uh, we we can discuss how we do it, but uh, definitely it is correct. It depends on the sync, what that mechanism is. It's not a it's not a problem that you can actually solve within the engine. Only by as Bamot said, by the engine working together with the specific connector, you can ach achieve that. Any other questions? We are available after the talk. Uh, if, if, if you wanna want more details or have any other questions, we will be there uh, at the room, at the door. Thank you. Thank you.